what I want to talk about today is impact evaluators. So this is probably the third talk I've given at CryptoCon Day about impact evaluators. And in this one, uh, I'm going to give a quick refresher, refresher about what they are. I'm going to walk through kind of like a set of instructions for how might you uh, design an IE. Um, and then I'm going to give an example of, the, of an IE potentially that could be used to incentivize and reward the Saturn Sunrise program folks. Um, so that third example is just kind of like, think of it as a, as a, um, uh, as a throwaway example that is meant to be very modular, um, could be used for a lot of components, and it doesn't kind of, um, a lot of what other people have talked about in terms of Saturn um, can plug into it. It's just, uh, I want to describe it in terms of building an IE. Uh, great, so what are impact evaluators? Uh, these are mechanisms that we have um, kind of articulated as um, these kind of objects in the, in, the, um, in, in the economy or in the environment uh, that can organize a community of agents to achieve a shared objective. Um, and the way that these mechanisms work is that they combine a set of measurements uh, about that potential objective and a set of funds with a way of rewarding the community of agents for work towards the objective. Um, that seems pretty straightforward, right? Like, but in reality, doing this right uh, is quite hard. Uh, you can think of these mechanisms as um, pretty uh, um, self, uh, well composed such that you can connect them into larger uh, things or you can use them as a component in a much larger system. So an example of an impact evaluator might be the Bitcoin block reward. The Bitcoin block reward has a kind of reserve of Bitcoin, you know, the 21 million Bitcoin. It has a, a set of contributors that are going to contribute to the to the um, to maintaining the Bitcoin blockchain, and so that work involves producing blocks, getting transactions. But primarily, what the impact evaluator rewards is um, hash rate contributed to the network. Um, then the impact evaluator needs an evaluation function. That evaluation function, in the case of Bitcoin, is measuring over time how much work is being contributed and what your share of work contributed is. So um, this is where uh, I think impact evaluators were kind of hidden in, in uh, uh, the, the way the block reward in Bitcoin is built is not very straightforward in that that evaluation function has to do the kind of difficulty adjustment, like that two week period difficulty uh, readjustment, and it has to measure your contribution based on like the proof of work thing of like the, that number of zeros that are leading in a hash. So it's kind of like a very roundabout way of just assessing how much hash rate you're contributing to the network. Um, and then you get your reward, which in Bitcoin's case is, is the Coinbase transaction where like, you know, you as a miner um, get to uh, mint some amount of Bitcoin and you subtract it from the reserve and you give it to, uh, give it to the miner. So it's an example of an impact evaluator. Um, the Bitcoin um, block reward is perhaps like the most uh, common example and that a lot of groups might know, uh, but the Filecoin block reward works in a similar way. That's a more complex impact evaluator because again, it has a reserve, um, it has a set of contributors, it has an evaluation function, but that evaluation function is more complex. It includes, um, it's not about hash rate, it's about capacity contributed. Um, it has to account for a large scale proof of replication to know that capacity has been contributed uh, well. And it also gets tuned with the kind of baseline minting um, uh, function. So that kind of uh, factors in as a part, plus the Filecoin Plus uh, component, which kind of scales the multiplier for once you use data. At the end of the day, it's kind of like this larger impact evaluator that is um, you know, rewarding the success of, success of Filecoin. Um, you can think of impact evaluators as a control system uh, loop. Uh, and so you can think of kind of these, these mechanisms that you can use in kind of control theory with uh, some component that is uh, providing some um, input to, uh, to the system. The system kind of behaves in some way. There's some sensor that's evaluating and measuring the system and that feeds back into the controller, which then decides some other, some other component. And so think of using impact evaluators in this kind of control uh, theory sort of way. Uh, it's an interesting side note. I was giving a version of this talk uh, last week at Funding the Commons, and someone pointed out that there's like this Nobel Prize winning economics result about how you can't possibly do this in economics. And, but it turns out that the, the key uh, component in that result is that you can't do it because normally these things get instantiated by people and people cannot be trusted not to change their mind and cannot be trusted not to go back and unwind the mechanism. So critically here, uh, two in interesting insights. One, we might be, have a way of like working around that really big result um, and be able to kind of comp create a, a construction that is um, where the mechanism is just kind of in the sky and you can rely on it. Um, and two, that means that it's 
uh, probably a whole swath of um, areas of, of economics might be ripe for uh, revisiting with these kinds of tools. Uh, so I'll leave that as a, as a future exercise for all of us to do. Um, uh, so that, you know, it's pretty interesting, pretty promising, and, and it's kind of crazy that, like, you know, it sort of, like, took Bitcoin uh, appearing and, um, you know, cryptography uh, de deploying these, like, large-scale networks to be able to kind of um, go back and, and kind of create these systems. Um, so the way that you want to think about these impact evaluators, uh, or, like, kind of a, another view into it is that, you know, think of dividing up the time into some set of periods. Um, think of uh, for each, you know, in that, for each period or for each round, you're going to measure the world, um, and that measurement of the world has to include the work that participants are doing towards the objective. Now, of course, you can't measure everything, so you want to be selective about like what components you're going to be uh, extracting. You then want to um, evaluate those measurements in terms of like uh, what the contributions were from the different participants, uh, and then you want to use those kind of the resulting weights in a sense to then feed into some kind of reward function. Now, you, in any kind of implementation of an IE, you might not see the actual kind of code or implementation follow these kind of three steps um, because they might be blended in some way. Um, you know, so maybe the way in which you measure something gives you the, the actual weights right away, or maybe the way in which you evaluate things um, like directly mints the reward. So in Bitcoin's case, the evaluation function just gives the reward to one miner per block, but in expectation you get this behavior, this behavior of like overall measurement, overall proportional reward, and, and so on. But basically this kind of like what's happening on expectation each round. Um, and one important component here is that evaluation does not need to be um, programmatic. So a way to feed this uh, into human judgment might be a way to kind of call out to, you know, once you've measured things, call out to some other set of processes, then evaluate the, the, um, the measurements and produce some output that then gets fed back into the, into the impact evaluator. So this might be a way of like hooking up a smart contract to some much larger scale processing system, like, you know, large scale computation, or um, people, right? They can feed in people into the loop here um, to uh, tweak the, to, to kind of like tune what the, what the reward function should be. Uh, you can model the kind of, um, the retroactive uh, experiment from optimism, I think, as a, if they had kept it going round after round after round, um, you can think of that as an impact evaluator um, that kind of can, could run on chain and still factor in human input into the, into the system. Uh, cool. So one other neat thing about these things is that be, you can think of them as valves in a network. So, so not just kind of this uh, control theory loop, but you could actually think of it as a valve where you have an inflow of money, you have an outflow of, mo of money, and the sensor tunes the redistribution of that inflow to outflow valve, right? So you can think of that component as a pretty flexible structure um, that could be fit into a system. So most IEs right now are just kind of these reserve-oriented IEs. You pile in the money first, then kind of it gets released out. But you could couple this kind of thing, not just as, in terms of, a, of like a stock of, of, um, uh, of some currency, but in the flow of some currency or the flow of some transactions. And so that gives rise to much more interesting components where you can wire up like lattices of, of these, me these mechanisms and kind of couple the, like the inflows and outflows and so on. Um, and so that's, I think, how you can build much more sophisticated things. Like, because, uh, you know, in the Saturn example that I'll give in a moment, you can think of, like, parties hiring the Saturn network, and when they hire the Saturn network, they pay the Saturn network, but when they pay the Saturn network, that payment comes into an IE, and then kind of that becomes flow that gets distributed out to, uh, to the users. Uh, another component about IEs is that uh, they don't have to be zero-sum. Um, well, definitely they shouldn't be negative-sum. That would be a bad, bad way of grouping people to achieve an objective, but they should definitely, you could start making them not just positive sum, but you can make them uh, potential, ideally kind of Pareto efficient or, or Pareto um, preferred, where everybody's kind of like winning by collaborating. And a way of doing that is that you could just kind of like release rewards um, in a super linear function relative to the impact of the KPI, right? So uh, in a sense, this is how, um, kind of like how the baseline uh, mechanism ends up working out in in Filecoin a little bit where there's like a slight superlinearity there where uh, parties working together um, end up kind of um, uh, receiving more um, as, as a whole group. Uh, however, this could probably be stretched uh, much further. So th this is kind of an interesting component. You have to um, prevent incentives to create civil identities, um, but this might be like a pretty interesting way to mix this with something kind of like, um, yeah, with, with all the kind of like hard identity uh, 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 constructions and so on to be able to 
um, provide a very, very strong incentive to collaborate. Um, maybe a quick, uh, th is this, what I'm saying here, like clear or, um, never quite tell if my explanation here is, is like uh, obvious. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, you definitely wanna avoid the, that and you wanna get into prior to preferred outcomes. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Cool, so how to design an IE. Uh, I'm gonna go through a few steps of how we might do this, uh, and then I'm gonna give you an example with uh, Saturn. So first off, you wanna identify the objective. Like before you think about incentives, before you think about rewards and so on, what are you trying to do? Um, what, is the, what are you trying to convince a group of people um, to work together towards? Get like super concrete in terms of the objectives, get super clear in terms of um, the description because it's going to matter when you um, start constructing the incentives. So in the Saturn example, what we're trying to do is to get a community of participants to provide sub-second resolution, like CDN quality um, resolution of content um, dissemination around the world, right? So like that's kind of the, the broad objective. So organize a group of participants to distribute content out to users with sub-second quality um, of delivery. And you know, good bandwidth and all, you know, there's a set of like metrics there that you can start thinking about. Uh, the next thing you wanna do is identify one metric or a set of metrics that, that optimize that, that objective, right? So the, um, now it's not gonna be perfect and usually you'll end up with multiple metrics and in that case, you then are gonna be faced with a decision of how are you gonna combine those metrics into one because that function, you, you, can, you can't optimize for multiple things. When you optimize for multiple things, you're just optimizing for a function of those things. So be very explicit and concrete with that function. Um, as an example, the Filecoin Plus function is, is kind of rewarding um, useful storage 10 times more than capacity. And like there's, there's an explicit kind of optimization function uh, embedded in that. So here, um, if we wanna deliver things uh, in a sub-second way, if we wanna have a lot of nodes that are uh, part of the network and ready to receive people's content and distribute it, um, that's kind of a factor in, in, in place. Um, we want to reward not just kind of like getting to the first byte, but actually full delivery of that content um, and so on. So it's a bunch of metrics associated with the CDN. Uh, they're pretty standardized that you can use uh, to, um, uh, you know, as part of this. One key thing here is that you want these metrics to be as easy to measure as possible. If you're starting to couple some very hard to measure things, it's gonna be a mess. And not, as, not only is it gonna be a mess, it's going to provide a lot of hooks for gaming the system. So at the end of the day, you're gonna route incentives here. So the more complex something is to measure, the like, more rope you give to, to agents to try and like, um, cheat the system in some way. So you, you want it to be extremely, extremely simple. In a way, this is why Bitcoin has like just like the proof of work. It's like super, super easy to measure. Just count the number of zeros in a hash. Um, you also want to identify clearly what are the set of contributors that are going to be contributing to this thing. And ideally that group, um, that group and the function that you're, and the metrics that you're, you're um, gonna measure are related, right? And so, um, you know, what exactly is the work they're gonna be doing, that it's gonna impact the KPI, what information, um, is that work going to be generating as they're doing the work? What additional information is going to be um, kind of left out to the world? Like what kind of interesting ways of, of, of getting your metrics um, might, might you have here? And one key component here is like think through the ways where those contributors might be faking the work um, and what ways will they be able to kind of like um, cheat the system. So an example for Saturn would be if a um, provider is trying to serve content to the network, they could just as easily instantiate a bunch of clients and pretend to do a bunch of requests and they can pretend to serve a bunch of requests and right away you have a lot of traffic that's all fake, right? And so like that's a, an example of something that would be kind of easy to fake and you have to start reasoning about how to like spot that and remove it. That's where all of the kind of like fraud detection kind of um, approaches, uh, approaches come in. Uh, but that might be kind of hard to fake relative to being able to instantiate nodes everywhere in the world, or you might be able to like spot that signal by looking at the whole, um, at, at all of the network. One piece here in terms of contributors and metrics, if you start finding that you're optimizing for multiple metrics and multiple groups, you may wanna consider splitting this into multiple IEs as opposed to just having one object, one, one impact evaluator, think of having multiple, and then you can then later wire those together. Um, now here's where like you, you take your, the, the metrics that you wanna gather and the contributors and so on, and now come up with like some very concrete ways in which you're going to measure that work and, and achieve like kind of like the KPIs um, and just get super concrete about like the, the detail, like what processes are gonna be involved, who's going to run them, um, what kind of error rate are you gonna have, 
Like, is that an acceptable level of error? Um, are you right about that error? Um, and so on. So as you've like gotten all the way here, you now start have started piecing together some objectives, some some global global KPIs you want to have, some group, some groups of agents, and some ways in which you're going to measure the KPIs. And now at this point, you start kind of like thinking about incentives. Um, and if you start thinking about like rewarding those parties and and you know thinking about some reward function, um, the moment you start doing that is going to like you're going to hyper optimize that particular activity you're rewarding, and you're gonna get less of everything else that you're trying to get. So you have to be extremely careful about what you start to measure on reward, and you know, think through like, how aligned is this measurement and, and these incentives that you're creating with the objective that you wanna, want to have? How aligned are the participants? Are you kind of yielding a negative or zero sum game? Or is it positive sum game? Um, how is this gonna change over time? What are the dynamics of the system? How are parties gonna start using the information and how they might you know, change, um, change the system? And uh, what are the kind of like relevant strategies that they might have? So at every point here, each one of these steps might cause you to rethink your entire IE, right? So as you're going through this, as you're identifying the objective, the KPIs, the agents, the measures, and the incentives, you might like want to rework the whole thing. So think of all of this as like good scratch work of like you're thinking about the, the structure. Um, and you, by the time you make it here, like you'd probably have changed it many times over. Great, so if, you've like, if you're happy with the incentives, if you're happy with the objective, if you're happy with the KPIs, and you're happy that the measurement is gonna properly account the work, then maybe you might be ready to like write a description for this IE. Uh, and I encourage you at that point to like, um, kind of rethink, not from what your objective was, but from what you've actually written in terms of the incentives and the measures, like what is the IE actually rewarding, what metrics is it measuring, the groups, and so on. What ob objective um, is actually drops out of the incentives as opposed to the one you started with, and try to compare those. Um, and if you can like des describe those um, well, then maybe you're you're off to like a good start. Um, and then you can want to try and like message it in some kind of like very crisp short, inspiring prose, because if you want to convince a large network of agents to actually do this, you're going to have to be able to t describe your, your um, KPIs and incentives and so on in very short sentences, in very short sentences that, that are going to be translated to many languages and they're going to be spread through the internet, right? In, in the case of Bitcoin, it was like provide some um, computing resources, mine some blocks and get some money, right? So in, in Saturn's case, you want to get to that same kind of uh, quality where it's like, hey, um, Add some, you know, share, d deliver some content, share some bandwidth, and get paid. Um, but ideally, you know, there's like that's the maybe the tagline. You want something slightly more more nuanced that describes like precisely the activities. Like, hey, you set up a, a machine is going to be online this amount of time. It's going to require this amount of bandwidth, and and so on. And then you want to name this IE. You want to scope the name. You want to not overpromise. Like you think of the Bitcoin block reward as the scaling constant SHA-256 IE. It's not actually securing the network, right? Like it's doing some work that might secure the network, but if you, you know, hack all of the Bitcoin miners' computers, you can like, take over the network anyway. So, you know, <laughs> good job, you got a bunch of SHA-256 hashes, doesn't matter. So, like, the IE, IE in Bitcoin is not actually securing the network, it's just creating a bunch of work. Um, the same, same thing with Filecoin's block reward. It's scaling the storage capacity and deals being made. Are those deals, like, really valuable data? Is that like really useful kind of adoption? That's a separate question, right? Like the, the IE isn't good enough to be able to like um, quantify that. You know, and, and, and hopefully like, you know, these are not good, very good names. They're not like super catchy, but they certainly don't overpromise. So you want to kind of like t tune those, those two. You, you know, like kind of don't, don't overpromise a thing because you're going to confuse everybody, um, but you definitely want to make it something catchy. Cool. So now I want to kind of walk through an example with um, Saturn IE and we're going to do this together with a notepad. It's gonna be awesome. So suppose that you have a contract uh, somewhere in the world, and we're gonna have some like um, reserve, and so this is like um, you know some amount of fill or something. Uh, here I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna follow kind of like the Go notation where you have like the variable and the type, if that's okay with folks. Um, uh, and then, and so we're going to be able to load this with some reserve amount of, of money that then is going to be distributed out to, to the world. Now, we want to have some participants, um, and so these will just be addresses. Um, 
So this is going to be a set of addresses, uh, a set of parties that are going to be um, part of this, um, this IE. Uh, we also want to um, track a set of measurements. And here is going to be a, um, uh, a double set. So one part will be a set of rounds. Um, actually, let me, I'll, I'll make it maybe, this will be nicer. So for, we're going to have like um, uh, we're, we're going to have a set of rounds, and in each round we're going to have uh, a set of measurements per per party and a set of um, scores. And so this is kind of like uh, you know mapping. Maybe we can do a map of address to score, and here we can have a map of address to measurement. Um, and, and so the idea here is that in these, in every kind of like impact evaluator round, we commit to a set of measurements for the impact evaluator, um, and then we commit to a set of scores. Uh, I'm gonna describe later how we can generate the scores. And let's see, do we need anything else? Ah, uh, yes, so in this one, uh, we wanna be able to run the computation in a private setting. Why a private setting? We're gonna apply, um, say, fraud detection and fraud detection algorithms. You wanna be careful about the fraud detection algorithms because if you describe them to the world, then that just makes it that much easier to cheat them. Um, and, but, and, and so you might wanna have like, sort of like hide the algorithm. And you know, ideally, all of these would be public and we can probably get there, but let's just suppose that we st start with private uh, information. I just wanna have that as a part of the example so that you can see how zero knowledge or multi-party computation can fit into the system. Um, so we have some like algorithms we're gonna run as part of this IE that are gonna decide, based on the measurements, what score the participants deserve in that particular round. Um, but the way that we're gonna run them is we're gonna have a set of evaluators. And so that's just a set of addresses um, that are gonna sign off on some evaluation. Now, that looks very similar to just a multisig. Could that be a multisig? Probably. Um, it could also just be another contract. So this could actually be simplified to just be a single address where using you know smart contract niceness, you can kind of decouple that entire component and have it as a separate um, as a separate thing. And so we can say that there's like some evaluator which can be instantiated by a group of parties, um, those parties or you know a whole other smart contract. And let's see, do we need anything else? I think that's about it. Great. So the way this is gonna work is that we're gonna define a particular period. We probably want to, whenever we instantiate it, we wanna, um, depending on how you wanna keep time, you wanna describe this as like a number of block times or a number of days or something. The, the way that you write the code is gonna, of course, like change this, but let, let's say that this is like, um, you know, we're gonna de describe this in terms of a number of blocks. Um, so far so good. Raise your hand if like you're following so far. Or I've, uh, okay, great. Um, so now, let's say that we wanna be able to you know, enable anybody to, to add themselves as a participant. So we're gonna have some uh, you know, add participant um, thing uh, where like, whoever sends the transaction gets added as a participant, and you, know, you, you also can remove yourself. So suppose that that, that is a way of like, editing this set of participants. Um, suppose that you also wanna be able to set the measurement uh, and sort of like, create a commitment and so here, we're gonna um, pass in a particular round, and this needs to be, must be sent by the, must be sent by evaluator. Um, actually, here we could, we could um, decouple the, the, the thing and create two jobs, so um, measure sensor, sensor, sensor is good. Suppose that you have some sensor, which could be as one party or a set of parties, uh, they submit um, the, the kind of measurements. And these measurements don't have to all be on chain, right? You don't have to take all of the logs and whatnot and put them on chain. All you have to do is commit to the data. You, you can aggregate it with IPFS, end up with a CID, and, and put the CID there. Um, um, now, of course, like this, you know, important bits, like this must be sent by a sensor, but it must not happen after, um, you know, let's say we have to keep track of like the current round, uh, round period, the current round, and 
uh, must not happen after after a round has passed. So you have to like be careful to check that. Otherwise, you would be enable parties to like set set the wrong measurement, um, and and so on. And and maybe it should only be must only must only happen once. Uh, must not happen ahead of time. So that just means in this code, you should only be able to set the measurements for like one particular round. Uh, a little bit complex, but once you get that right, then you have the ability for one sensor to submit the measurements into, into the smart contract um, and sort of commit to them. Now we just need set scores from uh, the evaluator. Um, and so this one you know, must only be sent by evaluator. Uh, must, and the same thing, must not happen after the round has passed, must only happen once, must not happen ahead of time. Uh, so far so good. Now he, here's where it gets neat, right? Um, because you've committed to the measurements in some way, this part of setting scores, this could happen a ton of different ways. You could have one party run, if, if everybody knows the algorithm, which you, know, you could commit to that by having you know, algorithm, a CID of the algorithm being committed in, uh, committed to, you could have somebody run that function in zero knowledge and run that function over all of the measurements, produce the relevant scores, and then submit the scores to the, to the impact evaluator um, with a proof that it's being done correctly. Uh, you could also have this happen in a multi-party computation, or you could have it in an optimistic setting where you have some trusted parties that like, you just trust to behave honestly. Um, but the point here is that you can entirely decouple that from the design of the IE and just worry about that in the implementation of this, of this, of how you want to run this function and how the evaluator uh, works, right? So the evaluator could be just a multisig that a, you know, a set of parties control and submit that. Um, you know, think of it kind of like the DRAND model. Or it could be something much more complex where that evaluator is a smart contract that checks the proof. Like there's some computation that somebody runs, submits the proof to that other smart contract, and then that smart contract then sends the scores. After checking the proof, sends the scores into this. Um, is that kind of clear? Any questions on that part? Because I just kind of like glossed over like a ton of stuff. All right, good. Uh, and then lastly, you can just kind of like run the impact evaluator once the scores are done. You could theoretically call this right after setting scores, uh, or you could have this be run periodically at a given moment in time if your blockchain is advanced and has something like cron. Um, so you know if you know this just takes the latest measurements. Um, uh, in, you know, takes the late, latest round, takes the measurements, takes the score, and then calculates the the, um, the the relevant kind of weighing based on that score. You know what what amount is going to come out of the reserve. So this part um, that's a function that we haven't defined yet. So that could be you know some kind of like uh, reward function here, where you sort of like have to describe the the function in some way. Uh, or you know, if you're kind of like writing this contract specific to Saturn, because everything that I've shown so far is not specific to Saturn, right? It's very general. You could use it for a bunch of things. Um, so ideally, you can pass in like a function description here. Um, I don't know if Solidity supports this. It might, um, or, or you might have a way of instantiating this such that you like load it in a specific function. Um, but but ideally, you kind of like have some way of parameterizing this such that you know, based on these scores and based on the amount of the of the reserve and the amount of rounds that you want to go for and so on, this reward function can decide um, how to map the scores for a given round into a certain amount of rewards that then are get paid out to the participants and the current participants, um, you know, based on, based on this. Um, does that sound, sound good? Any, any questions so far? Cool, awesome, super, super clear, super obvious. Um, who, who, who thinks that, like this is good enough? Like any problems so far? Any, any problems that we're spotting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, you're asking what is the governance of this whole thing? Who, who sort of governs this contract and who gets to change this? Um, I think that's specific to the. That's like higher level than this contract. That's like, that's a question that's kind of like um, partly out of scope of this. Um, because you want these things to be pretty general and used in a variety of systems, those that like where it can be static, like Bitcoin, uh, or those that will be changed by the community, like in Falcon's case with FIPS, um, and some where you want it to be programmatic by you know like votes directly on chain, like Tezos and others. Um, so I would I would kind of like define that as like 
th this contract, like all smart contracts in, in EVM style computation, might have like an like an um, an owner. I don't know what the address is. Like some owner address. And so here, the governance would probably whoever gets to rewrite the contract has that that governance key in a sense. And so you want to kind of set that. Yeah. So basically, how do you how do you implement the sensor? And how do you make sure that this is like honest and working correctly and, and so on? Uh, yeah, this is definitely a a uh, a lot of the complexity in the Saturn in Saturn's case specifically. A lot of the complexity lies in the in in the sensor for sure. In Bitcoin, it doesn't right because the sensor is just like oh, how many hashes, how many zeros are there in this hash? Sweet. Um, but yeah, in Saturn, definitely the sensor is complex. Uh, but the cool thing is like you don't have to implement that complexity in the IE. You can kind of like leave that outside and figure out as a, as a problem and likely improve the sensor over time. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so what is different from this, from like a current contract or something? Uh, what is the innovation of these specifically? Um, so this is, this is just showing you how to implement an impact evaluator as a smart contract. So it's, how do you, you know, remember this, this structure? Um, like why, okay, why are you, um, focusing on them and not a, another evaluator? Like, have you looked at other evaluators? No, so I'm just giving you one example of mm. an impact evaluator implemented in a smart contract. So I'm just choosing to give you this example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's, I mean, it's pretty general. Like, there's nothing here specific. It just shows you that, you know, block reward follows a similar kind of structure, right? Like, the Bitcoin block reward would have a set of participants, which are the miners. Um, the sensor is just, you know, tracking the set of uh, the set of zeros in a, in a number, the reserve doesn't get any additional money, it's just kind of like whatever it started with and, and so on. Um, now this whole implementation is implemented in hard code in a bunch of different parts of Bitcoin, just as a way of showing it in a Solidity-like uh, smart contract, or I guess a Go Solidity-like <laughs> uh, smart contract. Um, the other thing I would add here is like, oh yeah, one, one thing I forgot to mention, this reserve, it doesn't have to be a reserve. You can send money to the smart contract and add it to the reserve, right? So you can pay the, you can pay the Saturn network for service, and when you pay the Saturn network for service, its reserve goes up, as an example. So this is an example of that flow that I, that I described earlier, where it doesn't, it's not just the, the, the stock amount that you have, it's sort of like a valve over time. If it's succeeding, then it'll, um, the reserve will increase and, and whatnot. Thanks. Hi, it's Andreas from Legacy. So super, super stoked, super interesting. Um, we came up with two impact evaluators without knowing the concept. And uh, they're less technical, and I was wondering you know, what, what, what your thinking is about that. You know, one is you know, we're interested in high quality content in our network, right? and so we basically want to do competitions. Right? And so people submit content, you, know, you vote over that, and then you say, okay, well, the best 10 people or the best 10 submissions get award. Right? That one seems to be stra pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, the other one, I think it's more interesting, more tricky. So that goes actually straight into the governance. So uh, we're gonna have a data DAO to basically run our network. And we don't, you know, um, ownership doesn't make sense uh, in, in our model. Uh, one, one person, one vote also doesn't make a lot of sense. So the thinking is that we, our thinking was to say, well, you need to earn the right to vote by making meaningful contributions. All right, and then so exactly, you know, you get to measure somehow the impact uh, you have, and then you basically get a voting token at the result for maybe a given point in time, uh, for a given period. All right, now, this I think where it's get really tricky, right? You know, how do you measure meaningful contributions? All right, so it's, you know, nothing really technically you can measure. Yeah. You know, it's not even like GitHub where, you know, you have a sort of a formalized system. So it's it's, you know, much yeah. more loose, right? You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think uh, as we were saying before, kind of the reward function and the, and the how you evaluate the the contributions to a score or something like that. That's the um, when, when you're writing the application, you you want to define that super clearly when yeah. you're recruiting the community of agents that are going to work together to to do this, and you want to be very careful about how you how you change that and how you do that and and so on. So this is like. Um, uh, a lot of the thoughts will be very kind of use case dependent, use case specific, and you'll likely have to evolve them over time, but you want that evolution to be 
done carefully with, right. with like the right governance, right? You want that to be kind of like changes and adjustments that the, that the community of participants that are providing that service um, understand is like a better way to achieve the objective. Now, it might not be uh, the, a, a thing that everybody wants. It might be controversial. It might be difficult, but it achieves the objective. So as an example, the Ethereum community um, removed proof of work like because the Ethereum community said, hey, we found a better way to secure the chain. Um, we think this is a, a better model. It doesn't have as many downsides as generating all this extra wasted he uh, energy. Um, therefore, let's kind of switch. And that was a super controversial change that a set of participants didn't want. Um, however, that kind of like achieved the objective of the of of the um, of the network better, and so like one entire like subset, like one impact evaluator in a sense that was rewarding the shot to fifty six or like whatever Ethereum use. I think it's a different hash, ETH hash, I guess. Um, uh, you know that entire IE got like removed and refactored out, and so like one component got removed, but then it got replaced with a different IE that rewards the the staking, right? And and so that's an example of like. Um, governance driven like shifts um, however yeah I don't have any kind of like there's no like silver bullet there in terms of like one answer and one yeah, way to do it it's kind of very use case or application dependent yeah it was just one we have seen other people doing something in that space right so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel or other building on top of other people yeah I got it I mean I think I think there are a lot of kind of um, network intelligence or collective intelligence type algorithms that can generate good solutions for you in that space there's probably a ton of papers around this kind of thing of like how do you how do you use kind of like networks of experts to mm. to produce like good results or community voting yeah. um, for for this? And you know you can probably find a lot of these off the shelf. Right. And one of the cool things about this constructor for an impact evaluator is that it lets you kind of implement all of that behind one address. It sort of like decouples the reward structure mm. to have that running in the sky on its own, while you figure out like the evaluator structure separately and you kind of consult that as an independent piece. Right. Thanks a lot. And, and by the way, if this seems trivial, that's great. Like, that's the goal. The goal is to kind of like describe this in a super, super simple way such that you can go and like construct these kinds of things and try like incentivizing new, new kinds of things. Do you think impact evaluators combined with uh, open ec economic networks that uh, use generative flow models for their currency can help us build a world where uh, things are free by default instead of paying for compute or paying for storage? Um, yeah, so in, in all of these kinds of structures where you have something that's free by default, um, what's really going on is that the economic activity is be being subsidized by something else, right? So in the example of, um, like, Filecoin storage right now is cheap, uh, and in, cases, in many cases free entirely, and that is being subsidized by the block reward. Um, and so why is, where is that subsidy coming from? The transactional throughput of the network and the long-term applications that are going to be developed over it. Um, same with Ethereum, right? What was subsidizing all the SHA-256s that, or like whatever ETH hashes that people were doing? It was the transactional throughput of the Ethereum network and the applications that were being built on top of the Ethereum network. And so, you know, things aren't like, um, in the universe, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so you have to, um, you have to couple the economic flows. And when you're rerouting something to make some activity free, that, ener that energy is being comes from somewhere else and you have to like balance the equation so to speak and ideally whenever you're in kind of in a growth oriented structure then you can like a lot of things can be really cheap or subsidized by that growth but that will only be the case until like you kind of um, taper off and you stop growing as much and what you want to find is something that is very stable even when you're not growing or when you're decreasing in in in, in the activity of the network so that it's very stable and robust um, so like basically be careful with, with with the design of subsidies and make sure that they like are sound um, in Falcon's case, the, the, the storage can be free or negative, negatively priced, which is even better than free, right? Like the network pays you to bring data, while the capacity is greater than the use. Once the use gets to, the, to be as much as the capacity, then at that point it flips to then, be, be, um, then cost money. Um, and the capacity itself is subsidized by the transactional activity in the same way that, the, that Ethereum or Bitcoin funded the, the work, right? If it's super valuable data on the chain that lots of people want to access, uh, won't they be paying transaction fees to access that data, thereby exactly. making it free by default? That, so. That's exactly the, the structure of Filecoin, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. So, which is why FVM and contracts on top are like really important. Because that transactional throughput is gonna like subsidize the capacity growth, the capacity growth is gonna subsidize the usage growth. So just curious if in your view the IE is kind of a more abstract version of a machine learning objective function or like reinforcement learning models. 
Yeah, totally. Like, um, it is no coincidence that um, these things can form networks and these networks look like neural nets. <laughs> So that probably suggests also that if you design these well, you could probably use a lot of the ML structures. However, you're going to build IE networks of like tens, you know, under 10 or tens of these. You're not going to build thousands of these because for each of these, you have to like generate some function and, and so on. But I do claim that you could construct a set of these that behave, you know, like the, um, think of like, I don't know if I had an image here. I thought I did. Um, like control theory systems, like this is how people fly planes, right? Like we fly planes with like these controller structures to like sense the environment, sense the altitude, sense all these systems and then fly the plane, right? So you could f navigate an economy like this if you have like the right combination. But crucially, apparently from that uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning result, it has to be committed to and not changed. So the kind of like set the policy and don't change it is like crucial to these um, systems actually working. So in, in a real use case, I mean, in a, in a more, uh, in an actual implementation of this, I would imagine there's gonna be a lot of additional smart contracts that you have to call. And depending on the use case, you might need to do external calls to oracles because you have things outside the blockchain. So in my mind, it sounds uh, complicated and it's good that it's on a contract, but if you have a lot of loose ends that they end up in some kind of API calls somewhere outside, then is there a different approach that uh, you would recommend in such a scenario that doesn't try to do it uh, uh, in a smart contract? Like, no, no like I think I think it's crucial to have it in a smart contract because this is this is the kind of like commitment to the network that this is going to be a function that kind of goes over time. And the thing that enables a lot of parties to actually do the work is that this reserve is there. If this reserve is zero, then that's not a credible commitment to pay out, right? And so Bitcoin and Filecoin and Ethereum and so on are credible in terms of people going and doing the work because that reserve is large and it's locked up in the system. Like people know it's there, they know the code, they have read the code, that's all credible. And so you can go there. So to that point, like ideally the sensors themselves and the evaluators themselves are code that you can commit to and that everyone can inspect. Um, there are some complexities here, especially when you think about like fraud detection and whatnot, um, but maybe you can commit to the function and then tune the parameters privately or something, but you can ideally still run all of this in a verifiable way where like it's in zero knowledge uh, with zero knowledge proofs or MPC or something so that the entire thing is trustable. The, the thing that like enables this community of participants like to work together and achieve the objective, um, you know, kind of like to, to collaborate and kind of like have this like amazing prior preferred uh, structure is that there's a contract working to bind everyone together to achieve the goal set. So if you if it's all like really mushy and like not verifiable, then parties can't bet on this in the long term. The reason you get kind of like Falcon miners and Bitcoin miners and Ethereum miners like committing for years with like huge capital investments is because this is a massive scale commitment into long like years into the future that's not changing. Right. And like that commitment is like is something that groups can like bet on in the long term. And so you want to achieve that kind of like robustness um, in, the, in the system. So I would like say, th this is kind of like why I describe it this way, so that you can do the hard parts of sensing and evaluating outside or in some kind of like more sophisticated uh, program, but you have like the core of like the meat of like the commitment publicly expressed and publicly relied on. Hey, uh, so two questions. First off, um, it seems like uh, the sort of contingent thing here is that we are, are setting up some rule book and then everybody has to play by it, which means that we're at like fundamentally a first mover disadvantage, that we like publish the rules and then people can like sort of play them to try to like break incentives. You mentioned that like increasing complexity of those rules allows for more opportunity to break them. Um, do you have any other general advice for how to do mechanism design such that like it is not easily broken? And then two, um, you mentioned that sort of the pool of cash behind that you can like use to pay out um, is sort of like the the other necessary thing to like get this thing started. Um, are there any good metrics for like sort of bang for your buck between um, cash in your pool and like uh, impact on the network as a whole long term um, in like incentive structure? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, sorry, can you repeat the f summary of the first part again? 
Um, yeah, how buffer. do you uh, how do you deal with the first mover disadvantage of people being able to break the rules? Like, what are yeah, what's yeah, your so advice? Yeah, especially for something complex like Saturn, where you're, the metrics are going to be fairly difficult to get, and you want sub second retrieval, so you don't, can't like it's like a two party transaction, and you can't throw in another party to inspect the thing and so on. Um, then you are going to have to be tweaking the structure and learning from the system, and so the first the, like a lot of the first rounds will have to like evolve into the right structure. Um, and it's it's something much harder to incentivize than than like just like the proof of, proof of work reward of Bitcoin. Um, so I would say like that just kind of comes to the territory of building this new network. Um, the benefit is that when it's early, a lot of the participants get to split like split some reward with like less participants because there's just a lot less other groups to compete with. So there's like some utility there. Um, and so over time, kind of the the there's a kind of like a meta optimization here of like the the system itself like arriving at like the right way to measure the thing. Um, so that's kind of what I would say. There are disadvantages on both sides, both in the like joining the network um, early and in designing and trying to run the network early. Um, and hopefully, you make it up by um, by having like just stronger rewards for all groups uh, involved. Now, the on the second question of like, hey, how do you know that you're paying for the right reward, right? Like, how do you know that like your your um, evaluator is doing well? So the simpler it is, and the more coupled with like what you're measuring, the the better. Like. Um, as an example, like um, you say, say the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin hash rate like follows the 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 price of energy and the amount of Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin's price really well. Um, if if like um, Bitcoin's price increases or decreases, you see a corresponding increase in decreasing hash rate, um, uh, and that's just coming comes from like ca uh, parties calcu calculating ROIs. In Filecoin's case, you actually have to design against that because when you're storing people's data, you don't want people's data to like be be lost. Um, so you, you that's why like the entire collateral structure exists to kind of turn that very like fast moving signal into like a longer like time amortized signal where like you you're kind of delaying the um, the, the function. Um, but the kind of like the point stand is like you want to have a good sense of like the value that you're creating as a group and then factoring that in. So one neat thing for Saturn specifically and other things like it, if you take this valve approach, then you can sort of like imagine starting the reserve with a small amount of, of currency, like not a lot, as opposed to kind of like the traditional block rewards, and then factor in um, product demand, parties wanting to use the network and funding the network as the demand generator. So you can actually have a proper, proper regenerative finance type loop where the more value it's creating, the more money will come in and reward. And so the better the service is, the more customers will want to, to be attracted and the more money will flow in. And that way you can kind of like couple the, the, the service with what the customers actually want, as opposed to say the when you just have like a huge subsidy with, without like relating that to the demand of the users, then it's hard to uh, like hard to cause whatever's being subsidized to actually meet the demand of the user, right? So, so this kind of like valve structure, I think, will be much more successful to create these, to coordinate these large scale networks to actually meet the the, the demand and meet the market's goals. Um, I was thinking about that uh, valve idea um, and the incentives behind more people joining, because it seems in a decentralized environment, if no one owns sales, then sales won't happen. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you see that loop working? Yeah, I think, I think you basically have to um, measure sales in some way and design an IE for that, and then have a couple of these into, into multiple things, right? You sort of like have some, val some IE that's being, that controls like the, the intake, and then that splits like into kind of like sales and product development, and then um, the the work in 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 terms of the running the network and so on. And how do you set that? That's a hard question, and that's maybe for that IE to figure out. Maybe there are some like good. Uh, this, this is like a great question for like, how do you run a a service or utility like this in a public setting and kind of govern those those uh, parameters based on the actual real impact uh, that you're seeing. Um, so, but but I think like we're entering like a really neat design space. So, like if we get like the IE for running the, the the Saturn nodes first, working well, then we can design an IE for running like sales in the product in a sense and get that working well. And then we can once we have those, then we can design another one like sort of like couples between them. I had a question regarding the almost inevitable risk of arms race when it comes to fraud detection and uh, agents um, finding ways to game the incentives in the system. And I had an intuition, and I wonder what's your take on it, that if there's some form of coupling 
between the governance function that, let's say, decides on the algorithm and the participants who, let's say, receive payoffs that determine that governance function, they could essentially you know, be two kind of outcomes. One of them is they'd vote themselves the treasury, and they'd vote themselves the entire reserve, but that wouldn't be rational to do, provided that the value of that reserve depends on, let's say, you know, the, the value generated by the protocol, right? So the agents would have an incentive to actually perhaps, you know, make peace against the potential arms race and fraudulent behavior, and we might be able to stabilize uh, um, the risk of gaming the incentives. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so that's, that's neat. Um, I think it's possible, and in all of these communities, you always find a large group of participants that want to kind of like do the right thing by the network. Not only do you find a large group, but actually the security of all these blockchains right now is written in terms of a set of honest participants and a set of malicious participants. Um, side note, like that's a broken thing. Like all of these networks are primarily rational. So it's, it's ras rational, Byzantine, and altruistic nodes and the proportion of Byzantine and altruistic nodes is actually quite small and it's predominantly rational things. So, uh, you know, great encouragement to everyone out there to like actually write proofs about all of these systems in the proper bar model, like Byzantine, altruistic, rational, because um, and anyone who's ever like <laughs> run a blockchain knows that it is not, you know, over half honest. Like it's, it, it's predominantly all rational behavior. And the security proofs of all these Byzantine consensus protocols is based on this split of honest to, to malicious, which is, does not hold, right? So, so the entire blockchain world right now is lagging on like good proofs based on this rational model. Now, the, the, to your question, which is I think really interesting, is like can you create a, an incentive alignment there where parties know that the more they behave in concert with the objectives, not with the spirit of the, of the contract, not just the, the actual written code of the contract, like the loss of the contract, um, actually yields much better returns for them. Like, um, I think if you can't encode that into the rules of the system in some way, like you might have a meta way of doing that where you can sort of track the, track the growth or the, or the like, you can maybe track like how good the service is or how, how like track ratings from, from the users or the cu customers of this product and use that as a multiplier or as an incentive um, setting where like, um, that could be like super interesting, right? So when you do ride sharing with you know um, Uber or Bolt or whatever, all of those systems rely on star ratings that are very closely coupled to people's rewards, right? Like the higher the ratings, the more rides they get, the more money they make, and that's the user uh, providing some feedback into the system. Um, and so there might be a way of doing this here, where like the customers of the product can like produce ratings uh, and into the network that then come in as multipliers for all of the parties that were involved in pro providing that, that uh, resource. I just, I don't think that um, without some like incentives in code that actually change the ROI calculations, you'll get that behavior because you're, you're dealing with very large scale networks that are anonymous on the internet where defection is really cheap. And that's what's really cool about these systems is that you're getting coordination in kind of like the hardest setting possible. Um, and then building, you're being forced to build it out of like economic soundness as opposed to kind of like um, human contracts and like this kind of like broader expectation that parties will just sort of like agree to build a service. I think that's much more robust. And so I think solving it the hard way better is like yields much better systems in the long, long term. Yeah, I had a question on the subsidies part that we talked about. So if you break the reward function by aligning the subsidies to some different mechanism, doesn't that break then the alignment with the KPI? Like the example of Bitcoin is a good example where whenever the um, Coinbase transactions start to run out, eventually at some point, as people have kind of stipulated, there may be a breakage in terms of the security guarantee. So isn't that kind of going against the whole model to rely on a subsidy? No, I mean, I think, um, so, so in, in Bitcoin's case, it doesn't have this like neat alignment of of um, of the value. So, so a few thoughts here. One is um, this is why in Falcon we have uh, baseline minting, where there's a the the protocol defines a certain expected amount of of capacity growth in the network, and if the network is not meeting that, then the the proportion of the reward that gets given decreases. So there's a, a function encoded into the system as to like what the system expects to be doing. That's one example, but it's very crude. Ideally, you want something much more coupled to the customer demand and the customer utility as we were describing. So there might be better ways of doing that. Um, and I, I do think that in general, creating a subsidy upfront and just placing it there is very risky and, and like more error prone, especially in the long term, than having a flow, 
and tapping a flow. I think tapping a flow is much better. The, the counterpoint to that, though, of course, is that by, by placing this big reward in the sky, um, people can, it becomes really credible. It's not just a flow, and people don't have to bet that this thing will actually work and the demand will come and the customers will be there, but it's just like, it's a, it's a treasure chest in the sky that if you do some work, you'll, you're gonna get rewarded, and that's really powerful, right? So people could go and mine Bitcoin without caring about Bitcoin's future, and that was really, really powerful in terms of recruiting a lot of work uh, for the network, and so just kind of like, you have to, as a designer of these mechanisms and a designer of these products, you have to think about like which things you lean on. And maybe the right thing is to have like a large, a significantly large reserve that's there as a credible commitment, but primarily influence how much gets rewarded out based on the flow. As like good, like good work from that group should be increasing that reserve because the work is like spending less than the customers are bringing in, right? So think of it as like traditionally, of how you would traditionally think about a business or, 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 a, or a company or something. Like you want it to be growing in terms of, of its utility uh, and, it, and its efficiency. So you could think of like a measure like that of like um, how much the, yeah, take, take, take into account like the, the change in the reserve itself of like how much is coming in versus how much is going out. Um, but in general, I think like this idea of like switching to flows or, or how, you know, um, incorporating that into these contracts, I think, will be will be really promising. So I'm pretty excited to like write these things and start playing around with them. And I think you can incentivize this structure is like simple and general enough that you can apply apply it to lots of different kinds of things. Um, so I look forward to like deploying a lot of these into into the network. Um, I do think like we have to solve like the running running the computations here in zero knowledge or in MPC or something. So that this is like um, very very trustable. Great. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.